Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Genevieve Vachel, the Executive Director of New Hampshire Theatre Project. And this is our Community Connectors program. We usually do them in connection with one of our main stage productions. And this was with the 39 Steps, um, which has finished its run. We had to reschedule due to one of our many uh, New Hampshire storms. But we are delighted to have you here tonight and meeting our panel of local heroes. We talked earlier, Mary Lou and I were talking about, you know, who steps forward when things need to get done. So our host tonight is Zach Little from Kenny Buck Savings Bank. And thanks to Zach, but also to the bank, because they are one of our season sponsors this year. And thanks to our other season sponsor, JCM Management, as well. And I'll let Zach introduce everyone, and welcome. Thank you all. All right, yeah. So I'm also on the board of the New Hampshire Theater Project. And, you know, I think... I, I, what I, one thing I like about theater is like, you know, the, you, you're like really into like the core parts of like basic stories. And I was driving here and I was thinking about all the jokes about like the different types of stories that there are. Like, I think it's a Dostoevsky joke that there's only two types of stories. Um, a man leaves home and a stranger comes to town, which is the same story. Um, so, but I actually think there's lots of different types of stories. Um, like my favorite kind of story is like uh, people at work yelling stories, um, like a few good men, or like you know just like just uh, Glengarry Glen Ross, like people in offices just yelling for two hours. That's my favorite kind of story. Um, but anyway, this kind of story that I feel like dominates our culture now is like the the hero story, like the superhero story. But a superhero story is like a ordinary person in extraordinary circumstances. And I think the reason that resonates is because it is true, right? Like, this happens all the time. And so when we started talking about having an event where we would talk to some local heroes, like, I was just rattling off names because I knew so many people. And so I'm very excited to talk to all of you today. And I wanted to, like, give each of you the time to introduce yourselves, you know, with more than just, like, name and title. So what I would love to know is, like, you know, who you are and why you are here tonight like what was the organization or effort or thing um that you know that is the reason that you're sitting in these chairs so we can start with carrie all right thank you zach um my name is carrie norton and i am the executive director of hope on haven hill i'm also a co-founder of hope on haven hill and um, hope on haven hill's mission is to promote um, recovery and the health and well-being of pregnant and parenting women with substance use disorders in their children. And we do that by providing, um, by providing a variety of services um, and access to treatment. And um, before Hope on Haven Hill, I was a nurse. Um, I was a labor and delivery, maternal child health nurse, uh, maternity nurse, uh, pediatric nurse. I always was, was taking care of women and children. And I, um, I had the, the wonderful experience of doing that, and I also had the experience of watching a crisis unfold in my area, um, in New Hampshire, um, in general, in my own personal life, and um, as well as professional life. So I, was, I have three adult children. I have six amazing grandchildren. I have two sons, thank goodness, in recovery, and their personal stories really were, it was so hard and difficult, and I, but I watched treatment work, recovery was possible, and their lives were just amazing after that. Um, and it was so hard to get. And I realized that the, a whole lot of women that I was taking care of didn't have the same opportunities or people to help them get that. And so um, Hope on Haven Hill was founded um, because of that. I, had, I was having prenatal women come in, and it's specifically a young woman come in. Her name was Abby, and she, you know, she was just, it's, it just continued to happen that you know, they were, a, a woman was terribly suffering with um, addiction, and there was one place in New Hampshire that had this level of treatment that they needed. Um, and they would get on wait lists. And the time that it took, they usually did not get in before they had their babies, sometimes their second babies, um, or before they died. Um, and it just, her, her specific 
story was really um, impactful for me after I had watched firsthand how hard it was for me in a medical profession with really great resources to get my own children help. And so um, that's how Hope on Haven Hill was founded. Um, her story, it just hit me so hard. You know, she came in with her first pregnancy, first baby, and um, she was homeless and wanted help, and I got her on the wait list, and by the time she was eight months pregnant in June of 2015, um, she was still on the wait list, and she was dying, and, you know, it took a team of everybody in a, in a hospital to stabilize her and to call and beg to get her into this one place, and it was just enough was enough. Um, and so I think that it was sort of a, a, I don't even know how to describe it, except my, it was a mind blowing time where I just thought that this is just so crazy that we have, we expect women, expect anybody, but we expect, especially women to ask for help with no help. And I just thought that like, this is so crazy. Like everybody was like, you know, and they still do. They villainize, like, how could a woman do this to her baby? How can she do this to herself? And um, why isn't she getting help when there's no help? And so that was how we, um, that's how we, we started. We had a group of people got together, and I said, I want to do this. And um, we just, thank God, in naiveness almost, we just went forward and said, we're going to do this no matter what. Um, and now we've been open for six and a half years. We've helped over 700 women. We've had over 300 healthy babies. Um, we provide a continuum of care. Um, you know, we opened with one residential program. We quickly opened outpatient programming. Um, we opened a recovery house. We now have regular low-income housing for, the, for folks that are at that next level. And we are opening a brand new um, Center for Hope and Wellness where we're going to expand services even more, um, including to have a partial hospitalization program. We've brought midwives, nurse practitioners um, into, the, into the program to integrate, to have complete wraparound services. So it's been a whirlwind of amazement. Um, I don't consider myself a hero. I think I, I feel like I was a naive person that was really ticked off. And then just mind blown that this was what we had to work with and it just seemed stupid. And I was really grateful that like everybody that I ranted to said, yeah, that is stupid. I'll help you. And so, so many people helped make it happen. And then businesses, even Kenny Bunk Savings, like businesses were like, yeah, this is stupid. You're right, we'll help. And so it was just like this community and state just said, yeah, let's make this work. And that's really how, what happened. Well, I think that first of all, World One is right. We were just talking about how long has it how long has it been that Hope on Haven Hill has been around, and it's like I know it's always less time than I think because when I think about all the things that have happened, yeah. I can't imagine fitting it into those seven years. Yeah. Um, but I also think that you mentioned this idea of being like naive but ticked off, and I think that might be like a that might be like a, a recurring archetype tonight. Um, and because like because Hannah, I know that your story starts like when you were in school. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about like where you first got involved and, 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 and you know, obviously we didn't even do the introduction yet, so we'll do that too. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Hannah Marticello. Um, I'm here tonight because of my work with Dover Youth Youth, which is a drug prevention program, primarily um, focusing on youth advocacy. So all the members of our program are between, you know, sixth grade to uh, 12th grade. Um, and we do a lot of community outreach projects, community awareness projects, policy change, media initiatives, all you name it, we do it. Um, and the reason I'm guessing I'm here tonight is mostly for my work with Tobacco 21 legislation. Um, I've been working with Dover Youth Youth since I was in sixth grade, doing a bunch of different stuff. And I got really involved with policy change work um, when I was in seventh grade. Um, just for frame of reference, I'm, I'm 21 now. So it hasn't been that long, but it feels like forever. Um, so I was doing a lot of different testifying with my other peers. We would go up 
I remember the first thing I went to spoke about was there was a policy being put forth to allow alcohol advertisements on billboards. And we went and we spoke against that. Um, and so I, was, I realized that it was a lot of fun and I got to have a huge impact in my community even though I was 12 years old. Um, so that was the niche I really followed into and I continued with a lot of policy change work, um, both non-legislative and legislative. Um, and I got the opportunity to go and work nationally with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids as their like Eastern Regional Youth Advocate of the Year, which was a huge honor. And from there, I met a lot of really cool other youth advocates from across the country. And I remember one of them, I think he was from Nevada, and he was on the phone at the conference, and he was so excited because his city had just passed a Tobacco 21 ordinance. And I just remember thinking, well, I can do that. And so I remember as soon as I came home, I was talking with our advisors and I just said, I'm going to pass a Tobacco 21 ordinance. And they just said, okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. Um, and so I really dove in. It was something I was really passionate about. I was working with it for the state level. I was working at it on a local level. I was meeting with all sorts of people to garner support, New Hampshire Heart and Lung Association, New Hampshire uh, American Heart Institution or whatever it's called. Um, this was a long time ago. But um, yeah, and I remember you know testifying in front of the city council um, and the support was crazy for the ordinance and we got the city ordinance passed, no problem. It was the first, we were the first city in New Hampshire to actually do it in Dover. Um, it was a little tougher at the state level. Um, we didn't end up getting it passed until it passed federally, but there was a huge push for it um, on the city level and we had a bunch of other towns follow us. And it was just a really awesomely empowering moment for my adult advisors to be able to sort of let me just do what I wanted and have that moment to be like, me and my peers are actually making an impact. I remember, this is gonna sound kind of like, like I don't want to toot my own horn, but I was on like an NPR interview, an NHPR interview, and I was, I was speaking, I was like 17, and there's this guy from the Massachusetts um, convenience store association or something and he was like just like dunking on a 17 year old and I was just like well you know what I'm doing it and I've already done it and I don't care yeah. I don't care that you think that what I'm doing isn't important because I've already made the impact and mm -hmm. I think it's really important for adults to sort of especially empower all of the youth who want to have a voice in their community, to have mm -hmm. a voice. And I think that's mm -hmm. something really important that Youth to Youth does and that I'm very proud to be a part of. And yeah. I find it so exciting to think about like what all the kids who go through programs like this will do over the course of their lives because the fact that you like knew what policy change was when you were like in the seventh right? grade, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, it's huge. It's yeah. such a huge leg up and, um, and it's, it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Andrea, let's talk about why you're here and kind of like how you originally got involved. Sure, yeah. Um, I like to tell people I read a newspaper article in May of 2014 that changed my life. Um, my name is Andrea Miko. I'm a Portsmouth, New Hampshire resident, and I'm a co-founder of a community action group called Testing for Peas. And my work started uh, in May and May of 2014 when I learned that high levels of PFAS were found <clears throat> in the drinking water at the Peas Trade Port. And the reason why that caught my eye was because my husband was working for a company at Pease and my two young children were attending a daycare center right next door to his work. And so to think that, you know, water contamination, that they you were drinking water every day at this site and there was high levels of these chemicals found that I couldn't even pronounce, had never heard of, didn't know what they were, but I just knew inside that that wasn't a good thing and it was something I should look into more. Um, and so I had had no experience whatsoever in, you know, environmental issues or I'm an occupational therapist by training. I work in healthcare. Um, but I started doing my research and quickly learned that these chemicals were not good. Um, they bioaccumulate in the body. Uh, they're associated with multiple adverse health effects like different types of cancer, thyroid issues, developmental delays. And of course, that worried me, knowing that my husband drank this water, my two young kids at like critical stages in their development drank 
heavily contaminated water. And so um, I quickly organized myself and two other moms from the daycare and we co-founded Testing for Peas in 2014, 2015. And um, initially we were just really pushing for blood testing. We knew that you could do a blood test to detect these chemicals in your blood. And we, were just, we just wanted to know like how high are these levels in our body. And we got a lot of pushback. Um, from the state health department, you know, they were just like, well, this blood test really isn't going to tell you anything. It'll tell you what the levels are, but we don't know if they'll cause health effects. And I was really struck by, you know, the unknown was like enough of a reason to do nothing. You know, like yeah. our government was just like, we don't know. So right. we're just, no oh, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And I remember just feeling like that was so unacceptable. I was like, if you don't know, you have to do more, you know, like mm -hmm. thousands of people. At, at the time, there were 10,000 people a day at Pease working, going to daycare, going to school, like community college, stuff like that. I'm like, we can't just not look into this more. So we were successful in getting a blood testing program. And unfortunately, that did show um, up in, in the course of like 2015 to 2018, about 2,000 people participated. And um, it did show elevated levels of PFAS in the blood of um, people at Peas who drank the water, including my family. And so again, we kind of came to a standstill a little bit with the state health department who's like, well, you have high levels, but we don't know what it means. So we're not gonna do anything. Mm -hmm. And again, we were like, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and where the Air Force is the source of this contamination, the PFAS came from firefighting foam that the Air Force had used during training exercises and put out fires from like way back in the day, uh, we kind of turned to them and said, you know, we, we want health studies. We want, you know, um, we want, we want you to study us over time. We want you to clean up this mess, like stop exposing people. And so we were very successful in getting, uh, two PFAS health studies for the PEAS community, one that's ongoing today and one that just closed a little over a year ago. Uh, the Air Force has filtered the water, um, and they are cleaning up the groundwater. They've spent over $75 million. Uh, we've also seen um, our congressional delegation has been incredibly supportive. Um, Senator Jean Shaheen is like a PFAS champion in the Senate. She sponsors a lot of bills. Uh, she's the reason why we have funding for our health studies and has really held the Air Force's feet to the fire to clean up. Uh, Maggie Hassan was a governor at the time when this was first discovered, and she's the reason we got the blood testing program and continues to support a lot of PFAS legislation in her um, in her work at the, in the Senate as well. So, um, yeah, so, you know, where we're at today, it's been nine years. We've had a PFAS blood testing program. We've had two PFAS health studies. We've had um, the Air Force taking accountability and cleaning up the contamination. And so you would think I'd be like, okay, the work is done. Like we have so many great successes, but unfortunately this is not unique to Pease right. or New Hampshire or Portsmouth. This is unfortunately playing out all over the country now, all over our state. It's not just military sites with firefighting foam. Like in Merrimack, New Hampshire, there's the St. Cobain Performance Plastics Factory, and they have emitted PFAS like all over the Southern New Hampshire region. Um, I, uh, as a result of learning so many other communities, just like us here at Pease, I helped found the national, co-found the national PFAS Contamination Coalition, which is a group of community advocates just like myself all over the country fighting for, you know, PFAS change. Sadly, to this day, at the federal level, we still don't have any regulations for PFAS in drinking water. The EPA is working on it, but it, we still don't have them. New Hampshire did take some progressive action and did set uh, regulations in drinking water for 4-PFAS uh, back in 2019. So um, we're, we've seen some action at the state level. We're seeing more awareness and engagement at the federal level. Um, but there's, there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot more people like me and my family and our community that have been exposed. And um, I'm just really happy to be here tonight. But I would say the one thing that re really resonated with me, what Carrie said, I think I went into this also very naive because this is not anything I've ever done mm -hmm. at all but I was like a mom and my kids were affected mm -hmm. and I was really mad mm -hmm. and I was really angry. Um, and it just fueled me mm -hmm. to be like, no, we yeah. have to do something. You yeah. cannot just walk away from this whole community. So yeah. I absolutely resonate with that <laughs> experience. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I would love to talk about that, that process or that kind of moment, right, when you feel sometimes you'd be called the call to leadership. Sometimes I think it kind of falls on you, 
like that's something that I I I notice a lot in talking to people that are kind of like community leaders is that they're people that the role does kind of naturally fall to. Mm-hmm. Um, and you kind of have this like reluctant acceptance of like the burden of having to do it. Um, but I guess I wonder, you know, I mean, I'll start with you, Andrea. Like, did you ever imagine that something like this was going to become such a part of your life? No. Like, did no, you ever I... really have any ambitions of, you know? <laughs> no, it was just never on my radar. I, I've never done anything like this before. Um, you know, I have three little kids. I have a full-time job. Like, I just didn't ever feel like I had the time, but I've had to make the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it just, I, in many ways, I say, like, I don't feel like I chose this role. I felt like this role chose me, mm-hmm. <laughs> whether I liked it or not. Um, it's been incredibly fulfilling, inc- incredibly rewarding. And one thing I'll say is that in doing it, I feel a, an immense sense of responsibility that this is bigger than just my family or peas. Like I realize this is like, this is a lot bigger than here. Mm-hmm. And so that's another thing that has fueled me, even though there's moments where I'm like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Mm-hmm. I've been at this for almost 10 years. Like mm-hmm. I've had to pace myself and say, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Like you can only do what you can do. Um, but yeah, it's, I've never, I never envisioned it for myself, but looking back now, like I don't, it's, it's been such a defining part of who I am today. So um, I don't know what my life would look like if I didn't have this role, to be honest. Hannah, did you lead a lot of group projects like even, even prior to age 12? Yeah, I'm very type A. Um, <laughs> but I, I definitely never thought it would be something that big, like that much attention. Like when I would go and testify on other bills, I, it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed doing it and I enjoyed making a difference. And I guess I never really envisioned of doing something that got so much attention, like from all different sides, like people were commenting on Facebook posts saying horrible things about me, or people were saying like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Look at this, look at this 17 year old, like making a difference. And it, I just, I never really envisioned that. It was more of something that I was just, I just had to do that I wanted to do. Does that like, did that, that's so fun. I think about that with, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg, the, mm-hmm. the the way that people talk about her. Mm-hmm. It just freaks me out. It's like, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, the fact that people could be on, on Facebook talking, <laughs> to, talking negatively about you is surprising to me, but do you feel like, how does that stuff land on you having like grown up with it? It was just really funny. Yeah. Cause like, I mean, you look and they are commenting like on our like Dover Youth Youth Facebook page. It'll be like a picture of us that was in the newspaper. I remember I remember one of the comments vividly. It was like it was me and my other peers. We were giving a press conference and it's like about Tobacco Twenty One. It was like I bet all of these girls try cocaine before <laughs> the time they're eighteen. And by the time that was out, I was already 18. I'm like, well, joke's on them. I yeah. haven't done cocaine. So <laughs> already, already beat them on that. But it was just, I was like, yeah. why are you wasting your time? Like, why don't you actually show up at the state house and say something about it? Was my sort of attitude. Because that's what I was doing. So I don't know. It was just more of an annoyance than anything else. It's actually like the opposite kind of person, really, right? Now that we're like, we're kind of zeroing in on this thing, like what what kind of personality makes you into the kind of person that when these circumstances fall to you, you rise to the occasion. You know, I mean, like Andrea, you say that this role kind of fell to you, but there were lots of other, there were lots of other parents mm-hmm. and, and other people that were exposed, but it was you who kind of like, who, who took it and, and, and ran with it. Mm-hmm. And so there is something like kind of inherent in the kind of person who hears the bell ringing at all, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and answers that, uh, that call. Mm-hmm. I don't know, what about you, Carrie? Like, what was it like for you? Did you ever imagine, you know, when you were working as a nurse, like- the- No, I didn't have, I did not imagine it and it was not a plan. Um, I loved being a nurse um, and I was at a point in my career that I was working Monday through Friday, um, you know, when I was starting to have, you know, I was getting, I was getting some grandkids and it was, it was a nice work balance. And I, I had no, I did not have anything other than just really enjoying being a nurse 
and a Mimi. And um, it was definitely just a mind blown thing of this is, this is crazy, this can't happen like this. But that's the only reason because even to do it, um, you know, we had to fundraise a significant amount of money even in nine months to even like, to even start to do the, the to fix the house to, to do it. And growing up, you know, raising my kids, when my kids, if they played, they played hockey and cheerleading, I, did, I, I, I bought the booster tickets. Like I, I wouldn't even ask anybody to buy a raffle ticket for my, I was like, we're not doing that. We're just going, I'm just going to work a couple extra shifts because I'm not asking anybody to buy this hockey booster ticket. I'm like, so like it was a completely out of my comfort zone, everything. And, um, but when I look back now, I think it was helpful in a way because I remember, like, I didn't know the scope of how much had to be done. And um, a lot of people said, I don't think this can be done. And I definitely had in my head sort of like, don't tell me if something can't be done because I like, will do it. But I, I think the, I think thinking about how um, when I look back, the ability to do all of the things was if we had known what like <laughs> how much we might like I would still do it but like would we have I don't know if we would like you know it was a lot at first um and just being able to plug away to be like no this has to happen if we had known like and then that happens and then there's still all of these other barriers that you then need to address um and you know I'm glad that we didn't know all of the things. <laughs> well, I wonder though if you could have gone, if you could go back in time now and yeah. like pluck right before Hope on Haven Hill Carry into the future and drop her down in front of the nearly completed Center for Hope and Wellness. Yeah. You know, if you if you were able to see that, then if you'd be able to, uh, you know go back and, and understand as hard as it was going to be, it was going to be worth it. Well, I know that it's worth it every day because literally every day I walk in, I can have the worst day ever and I can walk in and watch, you know, women um, and their children together um, that would never have had that opportunity. And, you know, like we have super cute babies and that I like babies. That's always been my thing. And so like that doesn't hurt either, but like it's always worth it because we, no matter how hard it is, like it's so worth it when, um, when you see, I mean, you just see so much, like it's, they matter so much. And when you see a woman begin to realize that people care about her, like, you know, like I took for granted because I, you know, I just took it for granted that because we were a family that we cared about each other and we were like, we love you. We're going to figure this out. But like, the, you know, the women that we care for have none of that. And, you know, they just learn for the first time ever that somebody cares about them, like on a organization level and even more because like oftentimes, like even when, you know, when Kenny Bunk Savings got us a van, like, you know, like they're like, why do they do that? And like we can say, because they care, like people do care about you and people start to believe it, like when they've never thought that anyone cares about them because they, that's not how they've ever felt before um, or lived. So it's really amazing to watch women like begin to believe that they are worth it, um, that the community believes it, we believe it, the state, you know, believes it. And it's, it's, it's a little bit magical for me to see that happen. So. I love hearing you talk about it. And I do want to focus a lot on some of these success stories. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit more about what's frustrating <laughs> and about what, what, what's, what, is, what was the hardest thing? You know, so Andrea, what, what is the, if you could pinpoint the most frustrating aspect of all of this, maybe beyond just the fact that this contamination exists in the first place, or maybe that is the answer. Um, what, what, what is it about, you know, what, what's, what's been the hardest thing? Yeah, I think um, it, it's been really hard to know that, so PFAS chemicals are called forever chemicals. They don't break down and they've been manufactured since the 1940s. And the chemical companies who made them like knew the harms, you know, they did health studies internally on their own workers. Mm. Um, and they just continue to make these chemicals, profit off of them. 
and they are now in so many of our products. Like you can't avoid PFAS anymore, oh. unfortunately. You know, they're yeah. They're, at peas, they were in a firefighting foam, and they're in our water. But like, they're in our cosmetics, our carpets, you know, mm. our furniture. They're in food packaging. They're everywhere. So the more knowledgeable I become, it's like how how did we as a society, how did our government like allow this problem to get so big? You know, and so I think that's my biggest frustration source. And that even now, what we know mm-hmm. and what we've known for a long time, we still don't have federal regulations. PFAS companies are still making PFAS. There's over 12,000 PFAS on the market. <laughs> like, how do we let this happen? Mm-hmm. You know, and this is, these chemicals will be around forever. Like, they, you know, it's not just going to affect this generation or a few generations and go away. Like, they're in our water supply. They're in our food sources. They're in fish, shellfish, mm-hmm. deer. They're in our plants. They're in our everyday products. And they're in our bodies. Mm-hmm. And they cause health effects. And um, this will affect generations. So I think the biggest frustration for me is, like, how did we let this get so bad? And now that we know how bad it is, like, why are we not taking more aggressive action? Mm-hmm. Um, so. Mm-hmm. So Hannah, when you were able to sort of like, with, as you sort of describe it, you know, relatively quickly get a, a, a Tobacco 21 law passed in Dover, how did it feel then to kind of bump up against the state of New Hampshire and then have it, you know, not go so well? It was really discouraging. I think one of the most frustrating things, as opposed to like city level versus state level, is the different sort of conversations you have to have with the legislators because when you're at a local level, every especially in Dover Lake or small towns in New Hampshire, everybody knows everybody. So there's no need to appeal to certain egos. There's no need to beat around the bush with things. Just be like, this is what our community wants, what our community needs. And everybody's mostly on the same page about that. Whereas one thing that frustrated the heck out of me when I was younger Whenever I would go to the state house, I would always have to talk about money. Mm. Every time I had to talk about any sort of substance issue, it was always about money. How we would save money if we did this. How we would, you know, change the way the money was going. How it wouldn't impact the taxes. And I was just like, this is this is crazy that the way that I'm trying to get them to do something is by appealing to how much money the state's going to make. Mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to the health of the people in the state. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was really frustrating. And there was a lot of pushback from other organizations that had said that they would help in the past. That was really discouraging because there was a lot of talk about the language of the bill. And New Hampshire has really comprehensive, um, like, substance bills. So the tobacco um, law is very comprehensive in that it's about purchase, use, and possession. And so it's very tightly wound um, as opposed to having a more looser sale law, which is what other people wanted me to do. And they said, well, if you don't do it that way, we won't support the bill at all. And that was really frustrating, um, especially because I didn't want to loosen any of the laws that we had, and I just wanted the law passed. Mm. And I couldn't see how having it not go your way was, you know, worth not having it at all. Um, And that was really frustrating um, to have, to have people that had said that they would support me um, not. Um, Obviously not Dover Youth Youth. They were just as mad as I was when we had that conversation. But yeah, it was just a really weird bureaucratic awakening, I guess. What about you, Carrie? Would you would would the would the bureaucratic awakenings uh, be, be rank on your list of the of the frustrations of running an organization like Hope on Even Hill? Well, I know what she's talking about because like you have that is what you have to do, um, and it is frustrating. I think for me, the most frustrating thing was as a nurse that I watched every other medical disorder and disease and condition treated appropriately, treated um, with evidence based care, and treated exactly the way that it's supposed to be treated. And then I watch substance use and mental health have all of the, you know, the appropriate evidence base, this is what you should do. 
and nobody holds it to a standard of that's what should happen. <laughs> so like, even though we know that we should do this, this, and this, it, they, nobody like, and so like, I, that really frustrates me. It's still true. Um, and it still frustrates me. I don't, I think that it's discrimination. I don't, you know, it's, it's obviously stigma, but like, I think it's more than just stigma. I think it's discrimination of people with substance use disorders and mental health disorders. And that really frustrates me. Um, so that's my biggest frustration is that those, you know, these conditions are not treated appropriately. And it is, you know, and it just will take more, you know, policy change and people speaking out against it, you know, and for, you know, adequate par you know, parity treatment. Um, but it's just, that's what frustrates me the most, especially because everybody deserves to have all of that, any health care in that way. And I watch the most disadvantaged women like I, you know, like it would be really easy. Like, you know, they, they get denied care all of the time. And like, if anybody heard a, a tiny piece of why they even have a substance use disorder, like they would be like, they would understand. And it, and it shouldn't even have to be that, you know, it shouldn't have to be that. Um, and it's just like, it's just, it, that's the biggest frustration for me is the stigma and discrimination about being able to get care adequate care and also um, the stigma and discrimination of, of the women that we care for that, you know, even in, in the worlds of people that are, you know, with substance use disorders, other people in active addiction look at women who are pregnant as the worst. And um, I just watch them just, they don't, they, they just are suffering so badly. They just want help. And it's like, People don't realize, you know, you look at the bad behaviors because it's so effect it affects us, everybody. And it's like, again, like we expect people to be open and honest and there's consequences as to that as well, you know. So, you know, they ask for help and, you know, they're gonna have, you know, the division of child and, you know, services mm -hmm. all over them. And it's true, you know, so like, it's true. So we expect a lot of people, um, but that's my biggest frustration is, the, is that it's not treated like the disease that any other disease is treated like. Mm -hmm. And it is progressive and fatal and everybody is, is devastated. It devastates communities and families and states. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and I think we've gotten, we've, we've really moved forward. We've done a lot of great work, you know, opening options. But like, again, it's, you know, we're, we're still at a place where like we're losing 400 plus people a, a year and it is the number one maternal health um, complication like it's the number one reason that pregnant and postpartum women are dying um, and that's just not okay um, so I wonder if each of you could kind of locate for me a moment in each of your journeys that you kind of draw on as like, this is the thing, this is why it's worth it. You know, this is the thing, um, this is, this, this gets to what is gratifying about all of this. I don't know if anybody's got something. I mean, it. I have it every day. See, so I get go. it every day, so <laughs> I'll jump in. But like, I, I mean, I, that's the cool thing. It's like, it's super grueling, hard work. And I watch, so the heroes are the women that I take care of. So they are the heroes. They are the women that are brave and are in, and have been homeless and abused and trafficked and all of the things. And they come in and they do the hardest work ever. And I watch them do such hard work. And then they have all eyes on them from everybody in the world, like us and DCYF and everything. And they become the... I'm, I mean, I'm picky. I'm a grandmother now. So like, you know, I'm a grandmother that like, I'm like, but they are the best mothers I've ever seen. And I watch moms work so hard to be amazing mothers and they are. And so I see it every single day. I watch mothers fight to get their kiddos back. And it's just amazing to me. I, uh, this, this um, sausage cart, what do you call it? I don't even know what it's called. It's like a where you can go and buy, it's like at the fairs, you know, like um, a food truck. It's a food truck in our local area. Decided in September to do a fundraiser for us and, you know, had like a, 
um, signed for Hope on Haven Hill. And at the end, they, you know, they had they collected a lot of money because it was all the tips. Mm -hmm. And I went and he said, I got to tell you, he was like, I was happy to do it. And, and he's like, I, but I would tell you a story. And he said, one day it was kind of windy and this couple pulled into Home Depot. That's where the truck is. And he said, they got out with their two little kids. They went into Home Depot and came out and ordered and they were ordering. And I saw that they were whispering to each other. And, and I told them that they could go, you know, it would be about five minutes to go into their van and then come back. And he said, and when she came, they came back, she, they had put money in and she said, I wasn't going to say anything. Um, but I wanted to tell you that I'm giving and I want to tell you that I have graduated from this program and my life is just so amazing. And I have these children and, um, and I don't know, like there's 10 women that that could be, but like, he's like, he said to me, he's like, he's like, I never would have known. She pulled in like with, with her partner and these beautiful children dressed beautiful. And I said, yeah, they are beautiful people. And, um, but I thought to myself, I was like, there's 10 people that that could be. I don't know who that could be. And that's amazing to me. Like, I'm like, I've got people out there, like a lot of people stay connected with us. They don't all stay connected with us. And there's a bunch of people out there thriving. I don't even know about it. And it's amazing to me. And that makes it worth it. Um, and that she was brave to even say, like, I graduated from this program. Thank you so much for helping these people because I was one of those people, you know. So, anyways. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I love a heartwarming story that takes place in a Home Depot parking lot. That's the <laughs> best hot dog truck ever. Yeah. Well, I, I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. It's good. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I did try to figure out who it was. And I've got it down to like 10 people. I was like, it could be of like one of 10 families that I'm thinking of. What so. about you, Hannah? Like what's for you, what, what was the part where there was like the most gratifying or, or even just like interesting about it all? I think most of it was being able to show the younger students in my um, my group how much they could do. Because um, I remember there was, this, there was this younger girl named Elsa. She came up to me after the whole thing. She's like, Hannah, I want to do what you want, what you do. And that was the best moment of my life, yeah. to be like, have this this person I could mentor and like guide through the process. And just to know that this legacy was going to continue and that People in the program were still passionate about it and would take it and run with it. That was the most gratifying moment for me. Like, if the law didn't pass, if it, you know, withered out or whatever, that wasn't really what mattered. What mattered is that, you know, the impact we were having on the youth in our community mm -hmm. was still going to continue and that they were still going to be able to have the capacity to be able to cause change in their community, that they still felt as empowered as I did to be able to make whatever change they wanted. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what about you? This one's really hard. <laughs> I feel like I have had so many amazing experiences because of this work. Like, I still feel like it's a dream sometimes, the things that this work has, you know, given me opportunities. Like, I've testified in front of the U.S. Senate twice. Um, I gave a TEDx talk on yeah. my journey. Um, Super cool. I received an award from the EPA, you know, a community organizing award. Um, there's so many things. I went to the State of the Union with Senator Shaheen as her guest back in 2019. Like, so many amazing opportunities that I'm just like, again, as someone who, like, never did this work, I'm just like, oh, my God, yeah. how is this happening? And those are wonderful, and those have been great, and I'm, like, in awe of them, and sometimes they don't feel real. But it's like... Literally yesterday, somebody from Washington State called me and was like, my family's been affected by a Navy base and we have really high levels in our water and like, we don't know what to do. And it's like, for me, it's like the personal connections that mm -hmm. really make this worth doing because like, I know exactly how they feel. And like that person is like starting from scratch right now. Yeah. And I remember that feeling. And I remember like how kind of alone I felt remember how scared I felt and like anything I can do to like bring people comfort like when they're in that moment like oh my god my water's mm -hmm. been contaminated my family drank this water like we don't know what we're going to do are we going to get sick how do we filter it like any guidance I can give people is like what makes this work worth it for me and it it sadly continues to happen like literally just yesterday <laughs> I talked to someone on the phone for an hour from Washington who was just starting mm -hmm. so 
it's it's really that. It's like helping people not have to, I I can't take away what they've been through, but if I can help the journey be like less stressful mm-hmm. or give them more clarity, that's what makes it worth it for me. Let's talk about, you know, what's happening now. Hannah, you uh, went from like a member of the Dover Youth Youth Program and now you're going to be working for them. I am. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I actually have a, a meeting with the poli- chief the chief of police tomorrow. So hopefully I get the job. <laughs> that's <awesome. laughs> so that's cool. We can look forward to that. That's super awesome. Andrea, how has your role with Testing for Peace changed and what do you... What do you see happening over the next couple of years? Mm. Yeah, it's like I feel like I split my time between some of the local efforts here. So there's like lots of boards that have formed as a result of it. So I'm on the Safe Water Advisory Group for the City of Portsmouth, the Restoration Advisory Board with the Air Force, Community Assistance Panel with like the ATSDR, CDC. So like locally, I'm still trying to get people to sign up for the health study that we still have going on. I'm trying to make sure the Air Force, you know, they've, they're cleaning up and they're filtering the drinking water but they're investigating all the other impacts right now, like to plants, to food, to wildlife, really making sure that they're like thoroughly investigating and that we hold them accountable for everything. Um, I understand the drinking water was like the number one priority, but nine years later, like we gotta make sure we're taking care of all of it. Um, So kind of focusing on those efforts uh, locally and then at the national level, really just pushing for regulations you know Mm -hmm. to stop making PFAS regulate Mm -hmm. them in water like hold polluters accountable Um, and working closely with our congressional delegation you know we were really lucky in the infrastructure bill uh, Senator Shaheen was instrumental in getting 10 billion with a B dollars of that money for PFAS like I just am blown away by that that's a lot of money um, for you know Mm -hmm. states across the nation to address PFAS so um, yeah, just kind of splitting my time between like local, national, supporting other communities and just wanting to live in a world that's PFAS free. You know, I know I'll never see it in my lifetime, but if I can make steps towards that, then it'll, it's all worth it. Mm-hmm. Carrie, the scope of work of Hope on Haven Hill has, as we've heard, <laughs> like expanded pretty rapidly in the time since it started. Yeah. So it almost feels a little bit crazy to think about this, but like, what do you see the next couple of years for you? Yeah, I, I mean, with the opening of the new center, um, you know, the excitement is that we are going to be able to have a place that's a hub where pregnant and parenting women with substance use disorder will be able to really get all of their needs met, all of their medical needs. Um, we have a child care center. Um, we provide child care in all of our programs, but in the center, it will be, and you saw, you know, an appropriate size child care, you know that's gonna be run with Early Head Start. So like all, you know, the expansion of programs is what I'm most excited about. Um, Even right down to, um, you know, we have a life life skills um, and having a thrift store there that we're able to, um, you know, we're gonna do some contingency management. Um, You know, we already, um, you know, they'll be, we'll be able to, you know, we provide diapers and wipes and different things, and um, but to be able to start to like have it be an incentive um, for folks even that are in a contemplate like contemplating like is this do I need treatment do I want to do treatment things like that. Um, so I'm really excited about the life skills um, and just being able to integrate full continuum of care um, to be a resource for the state to be able to do that too. So, Cool. Well, I can ask you guys questions for like hours and hours, but I do want to open it up to the room too before we run out of time. If anybody has a question that they would like to ask anybody on the panel. I don't have a question, but I am so impressed with you women. I am brought to tears by your energy. And I have to say that sometimes with women, it's anger that gets us places. Mm -hmm. And it's sorry to say, because then you're criticized Mm -hmm. for that anger. But let that push you along, let that motivate you. So Mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm here. (laughs) Equally impressed. What about federal support and federal funding? Does that, do you get that? Does that help any through you? So the the women that we care for, um, a lot of the women are Medicaid, do have Medicaid. Um, and things like that. So we have federal funding in that sort of way. And um, and we have been recipients of federal 
um, opioid um, funding, um, you know, which is pretty similar, a little bit similar, like, like, it's not the only reason, but like, you know, like, the farm, Purdue Farm, you know, did the same thing. Like, they were able to do all of the, you know, like, continue on for so long, doing so much harm, and everyone knew they were doing harm. Mm -hmm. So when you say, you know, it is, it is really crazy that things are allowed to mm -hmm. cause so much harm. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, we're a mix of, um, you know, state, federal um, donor um, funds. Yeah. Same with Dover Youth Youth. So we're actually run um, through the Dover Police Department. It's a different sort of um, branch of it. We're overseen through them. So we get funding through them from the Dover Police Charities and stuff, um, as well as other grants that we apply for. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of um, donations from our local hospital, Wentworth Douglas mm -hmm. Hospital, mm -hmm. and a lot of other donations and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, as for us, like testing for peas, we have applied for small local grants to do like water testing or do other things. But in terms of like us directly, we haven't received federal funding. Um, but as a result of our advocacy, the community has, you know, like we've seen the Air Force spend a tremendous amount of money cleaning up and filtering the water. And they built three treatment plants right at Pease to address the issue. So um, the health study, one of the health study, or actually both of them are federally funded. One was through the ATSDR CDC agency and the other was the NIEHS. So um, as a result of our advocacy, we're seeing a lot of federal funding. Um, and the state's done a lot too. And like I said, they, they've they definitely taken more proactive steps to regulate PFAS and drinking water. Um, they've been very proactive in testing and looking for it, like not in just places where there's a military base or a factory, but we know like, you know, they're near some fire departments, they're around landfills. Um, you know, there's other sources of them. Um, in Maine, we've seen a lot of farms impacted by PFAS using mm. like sludge that is contaminated that mm -hmm. people didn't know. And then they spread it all over their farms and now their crops and their Oof. food and their animals. So, you know, um, so, we, but we've seen, so we've seen the state and both federal funding flow as a result of our advocacy, not directly to us, but to the community, which is the mm -hmm. most important. So, Andrea, you said, um, I know I won't see it in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most difficult things for people to wrap their brains around is this is too huge. Mm -hmm. I can't have an impact. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear from each of you. What would you say to people about that when they say, well, it's impossible. What can I, one person, do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can say, I know like a quote that really inspired me and the two other moms that founded my group was, um, you know, never doubt, you know, a small group of citizens indeed is the only thing that's ever changed the, the world. Same, so yeah. like the, I, that quote resonates with me so much because if I had known like in 2014, reading that newspaper article, like where I would be today and all the things that transpired, mm -hmm. I would be like, what? Mm -hmm. So, and that's what I tell people too, like this gentleman who called me yesterday from Washington and he was like so overwhelmed and he's like, you know, like no one's really coming to the meetings Ooh. and it's just like me and a couple of my neighbors. And I'm like, you don't need a hundred people mm -hmm. to do this work. Like it was me and two moms. Mm -hmm. Like, honest to God, you don't like just mm -hmm. a couple people who are on the same page, mm -hmm. who, you know, have a, something that they want to work on together. Like mm -hmm. you just put in the time and like reach out for help, but like you don't need a large group of people to mm -hmm. make a big impact. And like, I've lived that personally. I share that with others. And um, I see it all, all across the country. So um, mm -hmm. it really doesn't take an army of mm -hmm. people to make a big difference. I agree. I think people really forget the power and importance of grassroots efforts, mm -hmm. like just with any sort of social change. And nobody knows their community or how to help their community better than the people within their community. Mm -hmm. And while you may not see it on a federal or global level for 20, 30 years, the impact that you're making in the conversation that you're starting just on your street or in your neighborhood is already a ripple in a pond that will make that change. So while it can be really daunting to feel like you'll never get anywhere, mm -hmm. not doing anything is 
never going to get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. So you might as well do something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was really frustrated um, and opened because of, you know, my patients languishing on a wait list. And so I was thrilled to open and I have a, and I immediately had a wait list. <laughs> so like, <laughs> but like it does, you know, so I, so I see both though. And, and I had the same quote, like it was part of our first Facebook. I mm -hmm. was that was our mm -hmm. quote, but I, um, you know, like it's, it's, it's two things. It's literally, um, you know, we can, <laughs> what I was frustrated with, I have now and we are helping, you know, and, and I do believe every single person that we help matters. And I think that all of them would agree. Um, and I mean, a big thing is like, you know, you don't have to, again, it's sort of like you can't help everyone, but you can help someone. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's, it's important that I, I have seen a shift. It's, it's, um, there are better systems that, you know, there's more opportunities for um, treatment and support now in the last seven years in, in lots of different ways, which we're not. So there has been a shift. It's not perfect. Um, there's I still have a wait list. The other facility still has a wait list. But, um, but it's definitely, there's an improvement. And um, I, again, it's I, I do also think it's a grassroots it's the only way. I think. It, and I do think that I was also angry, angry and crazy, and I get it, like that is why it happened. Um, and I'm glad that it happened. I guess at that in that aspect. So. No. No. I get. I get asked that a lot. I don't know. You know. Um, not at this time, you know, I just, uh, can't rule it out. yeah, I can't rule it out, but I, at this time in my life, it's not the right time. My kids are really little and, you know, but, um, and I'm just, I'm so dedicated to PFAS, you know, like I don't have, uh, I haven't like diversified, you know, um, I will say though, I've definitely become more politically active. I've become more politically engaged. Like mm -hmm. just today I mm -hmm. signed on and supported a lead bill in the mm -hmm. state house. Like I wouldn't yep. have done that before, you know, but, right. um, so it's like, you know, so, but in, in terms of running for office, like it's not something that's in my future for right now. You know? I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to, and I'm committed to Hope on Haven Hill. <laughs> well, I, I think that there are a lot of people in the world who are definitely capable of, of helping and contributing and leading. And the hardest thing for a lot of them is just knowing where to start or, you know, they need to hear the right thing. Mm -hmm. And when I think back about the conversation that we've had over the course of the last hour, I think of there's so many, so many footholds that I think we like, you, you were able to put out there that when this is, when people watch this, when people listen to it, when people hear about it from others, you know, I think there's so much that can that can resonate, and I, and I, I like to think that you know that that will make a difference too. Mm -hmm. um, I love hearing all these different approaches to to the call to to leadership and these different sort of attitudes and expectations about it because I think the more we can like demystify that, mm -hmm. then like the more more people will will come aboard, and that's I don't know, it's really exciting to me. Um, but so yeah, that, that's our time. I wanted to just say like thank you so much for the three of you coming and talking to us. This was awesome. Thank you. And uh, you know, I feel like I learned a lot, and um, like I'm, I'm, I'm re-energized as I always am <laughs> after these conversations. Thank you. Thank for you. Having us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.